old school bodybuilding clothing company. If it's been three and a half hours since you last ate protein, and now you're starting to freak out, you are old school. If watching someone sit on a hammer machine for five minutes between sets playing with their phone pisses you off, you are definitely old school. OSBBC.com for the hardest training athletes. What's better, snorting cocaine or driving a race car around the track? Oh, driving a race car by far. <laughs> Look, it's no comparison. Dave Palumbo here, and we are back with RX Muscle Spotlight, and today's guest is a very special one. It's one of the most incredible stories I've ever heard, actually, and you guys are going to be blown when you hear uh, what went down. Randy Lanier was a... Uh, Typical guy growing up in Florida. He was selling marijuana. That escalated. He wanted to become a race car driver. Don't we all? And he became one of the most successful ones. In 1986, he was Rookie of the Year at the Indianapolis 500. He funded all his race car driving through the sale of his marijuana and ultimately got caught by the government. He served 30 years. He actually had an original life sentence. He served 30 years for marijuana. He's out now. And he's here with us today. What a story. Randy, thank you for coming and joining us today. I've never thank heard you. a more incredible story than this one. This is definitely a movie of the week, for sure. Thank you, Dave. But uh, in reality, everybody's got a story. And it's unique to each one of us. And it, and you mentioned 30 years. I did 27 years. Oh, 27 uh, years. Ha had a life without parole sentence. Uh, they sentenced me to... The remaining balance of my natural life, uh, wow. natural deaths for marijuana that they never found. I had what's called a dry case. I took my case to trial and uh, got convicted and got sentenced to natural death, life with no parole. And it took me 27 years to overcome it. Now, when you get, we'll go back and go over the story, but when you get sentenced to life in prison, I mean, I know I've been in federal prison. I was only in there for five months, but... When I was in there, everyone has a like a time, like how many months you got? A hundred months, you know, five five months. Some people have twenty six months. You had no months, right? What does it say on your card? Just life, right? I I have yeah, an L. I have a life sentence. That's and that, it's so, insane. I mean, how depressing is that when you when you had to face that reality? And how old are you at the time? Like thirty? I was thirty three years yeah. old when I went in. I came out at 60, and it's amazing how each person that deals with it can deal with it differently. For me, it, it, it put me in a spot of understanding my true self and a lot of contemplation, had a lot of time to really look within. And at, no matter what situation we end, Dave, yeah. I don't care where you are in life whether you're having relationship problems, financial problems, physical, chronic pain problems, mm -hmm. we have the capacity to change our experience to whatever it is we're dealing with. Chronic pain, Keep going, right. financial problems, whatever it is, our perception creates our experience. Mm -hmm. So having that understanding you can actually experience a lot of growth within yourself. Uh, and so for me, it, it was depressing. Maybe when I first went in, I went through one that bout of really being afraid and scared. Mm -hmm. But once I started looking into changing my perception and understanding, I, I could figure out how to make the best of my situation. Wow. That's incredible. Now, Let's go back to, to the 1960s. You were, you know, a regular guy, right? S selling a little weed here and there. How did you get involved with that? So in the 60s, uh, I, was, I was born in the country in Virginia. Uh, my grandparents raised tobacco. And, you know, I, I loved running through the tobacco fields and moved to Florida when I was a teenager. So growing up in the 60s was a lot of 
a lot of festivals, a lot of concerts, a lot of loving to smoke plant. Every time I smoke this weed, I've been smoking it for 53 years. <laughs> it's a sacrament to me. Right. And little did I know it was medicine. Yeah. And it, it's a mind born plant that really does one good for uh, numerous uh, reasons. So you're selling it, obviously, because you're using it yourself. So you got to make a few bucks inside. I know how that goes. Everyone knows how that goes. You don't want to pay for your own, right? So at, at what point do you realize, hey, this, this could be a pretty lucrative business, you know, that I can get involved in? Yeah, that was pretty quick coming. Um, <laughs> I saw that, that just I could hustle it and I wouldn't have to buy it to smoke. Right. So initially, it, turned, it was just something that I could do to... I wouldn't have to pay for, for what I was consuming. Right. And then it turned into a little bit more than that. And by 19, I was running to the Bahamas and bringing in loads uh, for other smugglers. <laughs> so you would, you would actually take a boat, right, to the Bahamas and pick it up? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my, one of my, my first boat was a ski boat. I grew up water skiing. Wow. I started skiing at an early age. Um, and at 19, I bought a, a Magnum, uh, Magnum boat, like a cigarette, same yeah. owner designed both boats, Magnum and cigarette, yeah. and ran to the Bahamas to pick up a load, and that turned into many trips. Uh, Walk us through that the, first trip. You had to be a nervous wreck doing the first time, right? Yeah, the first load was uh, very exhilarating, and I, luckily I had flat seas, yeah. and everything went smooth. And ha had it not went so smooth, maybe I would have got to change your how, mind. How long but did it take you to get? How long did it take you to get from Florida to the to the Bahamas and back? Well, how long is that oh, trip? From 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 Fort Lauderdale to Bimini is only an hour and hour and fifteen minutes to Bimini. Oh wow, that's quick! Yeah, I didn't realize it was so fast. Yeah, it's fifty miles away. Uh, you're now in Bimini, and that was like a staging point. Right. And, and Bimini's been there for many hundreds of years for the pirate days and so forth and sure. the rum runners. So it was always a place to um, stage uh, offloading where you could uh, meet the other vessels. Right. So you so you go there, you meet, you give them the money, they give you the stuff, you put it in, what do you put it in the hull of your boat? <laughs> no, you're not giving no money. Oh, no, no money. Go over that. No, no money. Not for me. Right. Maybe other people did, but. Yeah. I was just a, uh, a guy that was uh, running loads for other smugglers. Oh, I see. So you were doing jobs for other people. I got you. Okay. Yeah. And one thing about in the in the black market industry, yeah, you really don't want to mix the money where the product is. Got you. Got you. Yeah. That, that, I, 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 I'm not thinking like a criminal right now. I, so, yeah. hey. <laughs> so at what point do you say to yourself, you know what? I'm making these other guys so much freaking money. I might as well just do this myself, right? Well, it wasn't the money aspect like that of why I changed my mind to do it myself is um, situations occur with when you're bringing in loads like that, you're improvised a lot and nothing always goes completely right. And, and um, I was involved with some smugglers and had one of the smugglers that I used to subcontract the load back in the 70s, uh, late 70s, uh, didn't go so well. We lost the load, and the owners of the merchandise thought it was me that lost the load. But right. I had subcontracted it out without telling them. Oh, <laughs> shit. So, what, so, so you, how do you, what, you have to make good on that? What, what happens when I, that happens? Well, they wasn't happy, and I figured it was time for me to be my own boss, and uh, I stepped up the game plan and got a 68-foot uh, trawler. Oh, wow. That's a big boat. That's a huge boat. It was a good sized boat, but uh, by the end of the story, uh, it was a 300 foot barge with a 150 foot tugboat. So <laughs> I it just kept, I, I, it, it kept growing. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, the Netflix documentary showed that boat. It was enormous. That, I mean, what did that boat cost you to buy? The, the, the barge? Yeah. So the barges that uh, I was using one of my partners had a salvage and tug operation in Santa Domingo. Oh. And his barges was the vessels I used I uh, along with his tugboats. I got you. Now, um, when you were doing this on your own with the, with the 60 something foot boat, what, what were you, what were you making a load at this point? I mean, what was the, what, well, what are you talking about money wise? The, this was, and this was back in the seventies. So, no, this is 1982. Okay, you're right up to 80s. Okay. The, the 68 foot trawler 
my first load was 15,000 pounds. Oh my God. And I brought it into the coast of Florida up here in uh, about hundred and some miles from Fort Lauderdale on right. the beach. I did like a, like a marine assault. I did a beach, <laughs> we, we call it a beach assault. We ran in what's called Zodiacs all night long. Uh-huh. I had a crew on a crew on a beach with a house on the beach. Oh my God. And we just ran Zodiacs full of weed all night. Holy and that netted me a little bit, uh, about a million one. Oh my God. Okay. Now at what point did you say, you know what? Because this is where the story gets really crazy. And I, and I love it. You're like, you know what? I want to race cars. Where did that come from? Was that something you always wanted yeah. to do? Well, the year I just told you, I was already racing cars. I had 1982. I, I was fortunate enough to get a drive with a Ferrari team in Le Mans, France, and and had picked that up at a in in Daytona, 24 hours of Daytona. I got the option to <clears throat> drive in 24 hours of Daytona, which led to a Le Mans race with a Ferrari team. Right. So that same year, I ran that load in. I also was racing in Le Mans. So the things started growing fast once uh, I got myself involved from amateur racing to doing a little bit higher level racing. But, but how did you get the balls to begin with to say, you know what, I want to be a race car driver? Because and most <laughs> well, of these guys have probably been racing since their teens. You know, you're, you're like, I'm going to be a race car driver. Did people think you were nuts? No. As you know, when you have a passion for something, yeah. I don't think it takes so much of a nutsack. I think it just takes a, a, a passion to want to follow your your, your dreams and, and your, right. your your little goals that you want to set up. Right. And a lot of times when we do things, it's our intentions that where we put our attention. Right. And uh, my passion for racing started in the 70s. Uh, for whatever reason, I bought an old Porsche, turned it into a race car, right. and my, it, luckily enough, I won my first race. I entered it in. That's crazy. And, and that kind of was exhilarating and having the family there watching me race and win my first race. It, right. it, uh, the bug bit me super bad then. But I had, got, I had gotten the bug when I was about I don't know, uh, six or seven years old. I listened to my first IndyCar race in an old tobacco farm up in Virginia. And uh. just thought that was so cool listening to these Back in the 60s, the radio announcers were just so good with them old AM radios. <laughs> so it had me so excited. I, you know, had never forgotten it. So you never, you didn't have a fear of getting behind that car and driving that fast around that track? Well, I'd like to say uh, if you don't scare yourself in a race car, you're not driving fast. <laughs> so um, when you, you blink all that out, yeah. When you're you're racing, you're competing, and you're 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 a competitor, right? Uh, mainly against yourself, right. uh, trying to hit that perfect lap, uh, hit the apexes correctly, and uh, it it feels good when you get it right. Now you did something, that, you know. We're going to talk about your successes, but one of the things that you were able to do was because you were selling the marijuana and making so much money, you didn't have to be beholden to another. To a sponsor, essentially. A spon- essentially, you were your own sponsor. You created your own team. You made up your own name. No one knew where the money was coming from, I guess, initially, at least. And basically, the budget was unlimited, right? Because you were the guy unlimited. funding it. Unlimited so, budget. Yeah. So, I mean, these guys couldn't keep up with you because the name brand sponsored guys had a budget they had to work within. And you probably could just do whatever you wanted, right? Well, the Porsche factory, the Jaguar factory, and the Ford factory by 1984 was so involved with sports car racing, mm-hmm. their budget was huge, I'm sure. Okay. Because I know what I was taking to, to rent tracks, uh, to get uh, as much time as a, t- uh, tr- a track testing with your R&D. I, uh, I was developing carbon fiber brakes in 1984 before wow. they even come out holy uh, mackerel. our team was developing some cooling systems for uh that would chest and and hat cooling systems so i had no budget and i was ch- taking it to the limit as far as as much time as i could be at the track or research and development for what we needed to get ourselves faster with the team competing against the ford factory and the jaguar factory and the porsche factory 
we was on it. So the, the larger the loads, the more I could spend. <laughs> well, I'm sure your mechanics there and all the guys that were working on the development of these cars, they must have been loving it because you basically <laughs> said, look, whatever you need, I'll, I'll get you. And, and, and they're beating like the, the, the number one, you know, number two, number three guys in the business. These, these, you're making Ford look like ridiculous and, you, and you're some no-name you know, uh, basically outfit. Where did you get your people? Did you steal the best away from the uh, these other factories? Yeah, good question. Uh, uh, one of my partners uh, who recently passed away, he was uh, an airplane racer. He raced P-51 Mustangs out in Reno. Um, he had been racing. He had a little bit more experience than I did. He had won Le Mans in 1979. That's Bill Whittington mm -hmm. and his brothers. Uh, they had an idea of who the best in the crew chief business was. Right. So I went to him and I, I said, Hey, let's put a team together. Let's get the best crew chief we can get and the best crew members. And let's get, get with it. So right. we got with it. We hired a, a guy that had been with Carlsworth and formula one and had done quite well in Europe and ran Indy cars. And his name's Keith Layton. And, he just brought us to the promised land because he was actually really brilliant. Were, were these other other um, like Ford and Ferrari? Were they were they pissed at you? Were they like did they hate your guts because of what you were doing? You <laughs> bucked the system. Yeah, um, we won as a privateer team in 1984, beating the the factories, the Porsche factories, and the Ford and the Jaguar factories, and we hit them by surprise. I put the team together and. 1984 and missed the first two races of the season with the team wow and ended up uh <clears throat> winning enough races to get clinched the, the championship at, at watkins Glen grand prix the la it was the next to last race of the year daytona being the last race of the year right and um the, the it had gotten down it was two points between me and my teammate and just a couple of more points between our team and the Porsche factory team. It's crazy. So it was amazing that, you know, a lot of it has to do with preparation and, and, and some luck. Absolutely. Cause you could DNF did not finish some races just right. by a broken card. Right. So what I, how we contributed to that was after every race, every gear, I'd never use any used parts. Really? Every part we put on the car, had, had uh, brand new gears in every race. So oh that year alone was about $250,000 just in gears. Which was nothing because that, that's like less than, a, that's like a quarter of a load for you at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, that, that, it, what, uh, what did your cars have that you would say that gave you the advantage over the other cars? What did you have in those cars that were making them so, so great on the track? Well, our car was a March made in England mm -hmm. and it had, some ground effects, mm -hmm. as did some of the other cars I raced against. Right. But the design of the car and coupling it with the Chevy fuel injected motor, unlike the turbocharged motors, it had a little lag. Right. We had some some get off the corner speed that was quite quite good. That's crazy. Now, when you actually uh, you know competed at the Indianapolis 500, which I know was a dream of yours, and you were rookie of the year that year. Uh, and you're up on, on the track against guys like Michael Andretti, I mean, who at the time obviously was like a god in, in, in the race car industry business. I mean, were you like, I can't believe I'm actually here with these guys? No, I uh, – being at other tracks with other great drivers, Yeah. Uh, I have gratitude for being there, but I also walk at the track thinking I'm as fast or faster than anybody there. <laughs> that's, that's my right, mindset. Right, right. And um, it's funny you mentioned Michael. He's a, he's a friend. And mm -hmm. when I went to Indianapolis, he had set a rookie, uh, rookie of the year fastest lap record in the history of Indianapolis. And it had been setting there for three years. Uh -huh. And I rolled up in 1986, and it was time for uh, that record to – be broken, and I broke that record uh, in 1986, setting the fastest lap record in the history of Indianapolis. That's insane. Is that record still stand today, or is it has it been? No, that record's uh, been broken. Okay. Yeah. How, how fast was that lap? Do you remember? That lap was 
uh, right at 210 miles an hour. Holy. 209.9. That is insane to drive that fast on average speed around the whole track. Let me ask you a question. When you got arrested, okay, and the whole thing came tumbling down, and, and that's a whole st- – I first of all, I, I'll ask you about this after. It's got to, someone's got to make a movie about this because it's incredible. Um, but – did you say – were you, were you – I bet you were more upset not because you lost the money but because you, you had to stop racing. I'll guarantee it. Well, the biggest thing I was upset about was my family. Right. Well, that yeah, that obviously is a, a no-brainer. I knew I was, I was losing all of that. Right. My wife was pregnant when I started being investigated with twins. Ugh. And when the – between the racing – and the investigation, I knew I was being followed. I had a load out on the water. Ugh. It was 10 days ready, 170,000 pounds ready to be unloaded in New Orleans. Right. We, we lose one of the boys, one of our sons. Yeah. Ugh. So oh that was difficult. Um, Terrible. But the, the family, be, knowing that my time with them was limited and uh, I was either going to prison I was going to be a fugitive. Right. And I decided, you know what? This this prison stuff doesn't sound good. I think I'll be a fugitive. Right. I tried to negotiate a deal uh-huh. for about six six months. Right. And the whole time I'm 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 I'm, I'm trying to race and 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 compete in the IndyCar series. My attorneys were dealing with the U.S. Justice Department. Right. And trying to cut a deal with no cooperation. Right. And their deal at in Southern Illinois where I got indicted. I've never been to Illinois. Sure. But some of my merchandise say passed through there. Mm-hmm. Their deal was complete cooperation, twenty years in prison, and Ugh. complete forfeiture. So I shot back a complete forfeiture, no cooperation, and twenty years in prison. And they wouldn't accept that. So right. I offered them twenty five years right. in complete forfeiture, no cooperation. Yeah. They didn't go with that. So I knew it was time to kind of cut my ties here and because I was facing a, a, a life sentence. Sure. So what did you do? So I fled. <laughs> where, I'm saying, where did you flee to? I, I went to Switzerland. Okay. Um, actually, I went to a couple of places, uh, had uh, apartments in New York City. Uh-huh. Um, Flew over to Geneva and Zurich and t- taking care of some some issues over there financially. Right. And I had a house down in Antigua in the West Indies, and uh, that's where I was captured at. Uh, not n- no one knew about my house in Antigua, but my couple of members of my crew, which was living at the house, and I had a had a boat down there too. That I I think I got attached to this vessel, and that's probably led ended up leading to my uh, arrest. Uh. You, looking back and thinking, I obviously, you know, uh, obviously, you don't want to be a Monday morning quarterback. But if you if you had to do it again, and you had to escape. You think you would have had a better escape plan where you wouldn't have got caught? Well, looking back on it, I would have never went back to my boat. Now, right? I had a, a I had a vessel. I was going to take it to Costa del Sol right. in the south of Spain, uh, and I guess I got attached to the vessel. I. I I, it was a customized boat and went back and, but also I was doing other things. I was snorting too much Coke and, uh, uh, you know, I wasn't making good decisions, right. but looking back on it then, uh, had I know what I knew now, uh, I would have made a whole lot of different decisions along the pathway and sure. p- avoided all this prison time. <laughs> yeah. Now, let me ask you a question. Did you, um, um, well, the fact you you didn't want to be a rat is what you didn't want to do. So you, that that was the reason why you did so much time. But let me ask you this question: If you hadn't got caught, and 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 let's say you would have somehow gotten out of the business and gone legit, how far do you think you could have gone in in car racing? Do you think you could have gone all the way to the top? Okay, so in 1984, Ford Motor Company invites me to Detroit mm-hmm. to speak to them about teaming up with Ford Motor Company in 1985 and being their uh, Trans Am driver. Mm -hmm. I had a load out on the water. I decided I was going to just continue doing what I was going to do. I didn't accept that offer. I turned it down. How much money did that involve? So so that decision there with 
uh, a ride with them led would have led into millions of dollars plus maybe championships. Wow. Um, so uh, I turned it down and went on my own because I guess I was full of myself. <laughs> oh, so that was an ego. That was an ego. The decision. There. That was that. Look, I thought well because part of the deal was showing up at these functions. Uh, corporate events, um, car shows, stuff like that. Right. And doing and being what I was about at that time, I was, uh, it was more about me, 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 I guess. And gotcha. I kind of made a bad decision by, that was one of my bad decisions, yeah. not taking that offer. Wow. That's crazy. You know, I always say, you know, everything happens for a reason. You think maybe you, you I mean, you could have gotten killed as a driver also, you know, uh, along the way, you know, because it was a very dangerous so, sport, you know? Yeah. You just started to say everything happens for a reason. Yeah. I like to say everything happens for a good reason. <laughs> so we don't know those reasons at right. the moment when it's happening, right. but down the road, maybe the light bulb will go off and you go, yeah, because if I hadn't went to prison for the 27 years, I maybe want to gain some of the wisdom and the thinking that I have now. So my perception maybe would have been a little bit different. Right. So in the last nine years, I was a suicide companion. That means I sat with inmates that mm -hmm. had tried to kill themselves. Oh, really? I sat with them for four days, four hours a day. Wow. And for 90 days at the maximum mm -hmm. in a glass enclosed cell that had a concrete bunk in the middle of the cell. This is a, high security it's called maximum security penitentiary wow it's not an easy camp uh medium it's a lot of killings a lot of stabbings a lot of drama right and a lot of people that go through depression and so forth and they try to take their life why did they have so, you in such a high security prison i mean with we, we i mean were you an escape uh, risk escape risk oh. uh for 18 years dave i had to wear a a orange card around my neck uh -huh. and it had my picture, my number, my name. And I had to find an officer every two hours on the weekdays, every one hour on the weekends, every one hour after 4 PM and every one hour on the holidays. Holy. I did that for 18 years. And when they finally lowered my custody, I felt for, it took, a long time for me to not feel like I was forgetting something. I, <laughs> what did they think? You, walk, what did they think you were like uh, that Guzman guy? They were going to like dig a tunnel and get you out of prison. Well, they thought I had gotten caught up in so many escape investigations. <laughs> and one of my co-defendants crashed a helicopter uh, <laughs> in Miami. So that's when we had just gotten our life sentences. Uh. And, we was also had charges in Miami on some other smuggling uh -huh. operations. And um, he tried to set a helicopter in the, in the prison yard. <laughs> and it ended up the, the tail rotor there called a Constantino wire, flipped the helicopter over and crashed and caught on fire. And oh, shit. Broke the pilot's back and broke his leg. And oh, my God. It wasn't a good scene. No, 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 no. Obviously <laughs> not. No, no, definitely not. Now, let me, I don't know if you can say this or not. I mean, when it was all said and done, you got arrested. Did you, was your family able to keep some of the money or was it all taken? No, they seized everything. Everything. Uh, wow. It took them about seven years to, it was like a domino effect. Right. Things just kept falling into place yeah. and the, the FBI don't give up. <laughs> I got to yeah. tell you, they stay on it if they think something is happening and there's some financial Ugh. still out there, they'll look for it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, five years into my bit, um, my wife, my second wife and my dad and my brother all got indicted for what's called obstruction of justice. They Ugh. found currency buried uh, in PVC pipes. Uh, they found, they found money in, in places like, uh, garage walls. Oh my uh, God! How much? They found money. <laughs> they found money in 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 Geneva, Zurich, uh, Liechtenstein. Ugh. So, um, quite a few. They seized total from my indictment with myself and my co-defendants uh, right. 150 mil. Wow.
And you don't you don't have another mill somewhere like in someone's backyard in a tin can or something? <laughs> no, <like>? no. <laughs> <laughs> you would, hey, you, you know wouldn't what? tell us anyway. You wouldn't tell us anyway. Yeah. I look. I'm blessed to be here with my freedom, and right. I just I, I'm loving life, brother. I hear you. What are you do What are you doing now? What I mean, what are you doing to make uh, money? Lot, and- got a lot, lot going on, Dave. I, I'm uh, mainly right now. I'm vice president of a nonprofit organization mm-hmm. that supports cannabis prisoners and their family. And awesome. I tell you what, we're here for many purposes. And one of the purposes, Dave, that stays with us on this journey is to be of service to others. Right. And now I found myself, these people, about three years before my release, I get a manila envelope and there's photos. I go to my cell, I open it. Right. And there's these pictures of these women in front of the White House with my post, my picture on posters wow. asking President Obama to release me. Wow. And there's pictures of them at events in California and across the United States that they was advocating for my release. That's awesome. I'm going, who are these beautiful women? Look at this. <laughs> so I started corresponding and uh, they advocated me for the, for the next few years until I got my release. And That's I, awesome. In 2014, I walked out a free man. Wow. And uh, now I'm vice president of freedomgrow.org. It's a nonprofit organization that mm-hmm. supports nonviolent cannabis prisoners. Right. We have about 175 of them. And I'll give you an example real quick what we yep. do. For Easter, those 175 people had 126 children. So we made up 126 Easter baskets and put a, a little uh, water bottle in the Easter basket that said, you are strong, you are brave, and you are smart. We put Rubik's Cubes, activity books, and chocolate bunnies and candy with a $25 gift card from Walmart. Right, we do that all on, uh, all on donations. We're all volunteers. None right. of us take a salary. It's called freedomgrow.org. Right. And uh, just awesome. check it out. We're, we're all about... Uh, helping these have people. you helped these any people get out of prison since you know since the laws have changed or no yeah so we we help them throughout their struggle i'd like to say that we're all about what can we do right now to help these cannabis whether it's a book book or magazine subscription yeah. money on the commissary so they can buy stamps and pay for their emails and stuff like mm-hmm. that so we're not so much in legislation uh, our attorneys, but we're all about helping them and their gotcha. families. We we have emergency funding for uh, their family if they need it, mm-hmm. and we have a wish program. If you're a cannabis prisoner and you're nonviolent, if it's your birthday or your or your family's birthday, a grandchild, or a sons or mothers, we grant your wish. Whatever it is, you tell us and let us know. We'll make it happen. That's awesome. So we support the families like that. And just blessed to be able to be in a position to do that. What kind of a relationship do you have with your uh, family? Uh, You know, I have to imagine it was very rough on them. I've I've remarried my first wife. Oh, really? Uh, But remember I told you my son was a twin and we lost one of his his brother at at birth, Mm -hmm. right before birth. Well, I come home and within a year, my son, his girlfriend has twins. So now I'm a grandfather of two six-year-old boys. And I just took him last week to uh, Legoland for ah, a week. Ah, congratulations, so, Randy. That's I'm awesome. super close to our that family. Is awesome. Love it. Uh, I'm just truly blessed in that area. Uh, you asked me what else I got going on. I, I just dropped the book. It's coming out. I'll show you. Yes, I wanted to see that. They, I suppose you guys sent it to me. I can't wait to read it. Uh, it's called Survival of the Survival of the Fastest. It's about the tales of smuggling, prison, and racing. And um, just got blessed. Uh, Drop, been took me about eight months to write the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, finish that. That that comes on sale August the second. That's awesome. And um, just had a uh, a company pick it up, a studio that uh, is going to turn it into a full feature film. It, it's. I was going to say you got to have a movie. This is a. I, I look. I've seen a lot of movies. This is absolutely going to be a blockbuster movie. Who do you want to play you? Oh, I don't know. Come on, every you got to be. Th- you spent thirty years in jail. You twenty seven years in jail. You don't. You weren't thinking about that for a little bit. Who would play me in the movie? You know what? Uh, I haven't really thought about it because I stopped watching a lot of TV and movies. Yeah. Now I'm going back to the movies, and uh, 
Actually, I, I don't know. I'd have a couple of people interested. How about Mark Mark uh, Wahlberg? Well, that sounds like right up his alley, you know. Mark Wahlberg, uh, Jeremy Piven is interested. Oh, okay. Yeah, he looks uh, a little like you. <laughs> <laughs> so there's been a couple of people that are showing some interest. Uh, we're just right now at the stage of I inked the deal, and now they're at the stage of getting the screen screenplay writer. Right. I think Wahlberg would be great on, in that part. I think that right on. he would do a great job on that movie. That that's going to be a bonanza for you because I mean that you got a great story. I mean because you know what you weren't just a drug dealer. You were a successful, really successful race car driver. That to me is the most compelling part of the whole story. Yeah, everyone likes the drug aspect because it's glamorous and you had a lot of money. But I think the fact that you were able to achieve what you did in racing in such a short period of time against the top, you know. Uh, the, the top people in the business is is almost unfat. It's like it's like no one does that. It's it's impossible. Yeah. You achieved impossibility. You know, it, it, yeah, it's rare for a private team to beat the factories. Uh, the factories uh, are still dominant in in that sport. Um, driving the most exotic, fastest sports cars on the planet right. from year in to year out. Yeah. Um, the factories they have the budgets that can can get them there. But I got to tell you, and, and as you know, from bodybuilding to yep. weightlifting, yep. where we put our attention, our energy follows. You're right. And if, if you're on it and you're leading through your intentions, through your heart, you're going to be successful at whatever it is you're right. that you're, you're trying to achieve, what, whatever goal it is. Yep. And uh, Lee, I don't know just, if you know, I don't know if you know Lee Priest. He's a, he's a bodybuilder in our industry, very successful Australian bodybuilder. He got into race car driving too, and people couldn't believe because he was a you know he's a big guy. He's short, but he's big. Yeah. And he was very successful because he said he loved it. He just loved it. He couldn't wait yeah. to get in that car, and that's probably the way you felt too. I'm sure when you would get in there. Yeah, it's amazing with the racing. Um, once you really start figuring out the what you got to do to be to better yourself each time you do a lap. Yeah. It's like you can't get enough of it. <laughs> uh, I. You know, you just want more and more of it. So, what's uh, better, snorting cocaine or driving a race car around the track? Oh, driving a race car by far. <laughs> uh, so it's, you, it, look, it's no comparison. That shit the, the, to this day, racing still intrigues me. And I love it. And other stuff, I cringe at thinking about how stupid I was. <laughs> That's right. Let me uh, ask you one more question because um, the story is so crazy. I, what I want to know is how important. Give me the like the one to ten. The car versus the person. In other words, is the car the most important thing or is the guy driving the car the, or, or woman driving the car the most important? So that's why they call it a team. It takes it takes a village. Gotcha. I mean, you can have the best car on the planet, but if you're not having if you don't have the person that with, with the skills to get it to where it needs to be, it's not going to happen. Right. Same with the team. If you don't have the compatibility from the driver to let's say the crew chief and the, and the, and the chief engineer, well, to set up a car, the, the, the speaking between the two, they're not, they're not on, they're crossing wires and you're not going to get the best setup. So it's a whole joint effort. And that's right. why it takes a team. Well, I want to thank you, Randy, for joining us today. What a great interview. What a great story you got. I can't wait till the movie comes out. I'll be, I'll be telling everyone to see it because I know it's going to be great. You got your book. What is it going to be available on Amazon.com? The fastest of them all. The book is on Amazon.com. You can pre-order it now and it'd be in all the Barnes and Noble stores, uh, August the 2nd. And uh, just amazing. Just to tell you a little real quick. Yes. This is how crazy it is in New Jersey. I got awarded a cultivation license. So I I'll be in New Jersey growing weed. <laughs> oh my god how it, funny is that it, that is that what is, an irony it, right it's ironic that that you know now i'll legitimately be able to help the cannabis prisoners and their families <laughs> hopefully they'll be released by the time i get my operation going but please check out freedomgrow.org who, who would have ever thought you go to jail for 27 years for selling weed and now you're legally selling weed now, do you have your own yeah. strain? Is there a Randy Lanier strain of uh, weed? Yeah, there's some there's some strains. I, I, first, I've got to get my operation up and running. Right. But uh, we're considering some strains. Uh, my race car team with Blue Thunder. So I'm coming out with some Blue Thunder strains. Right. Strains that uh, won the championship in 1984. Uh, yeah. 
And we have some other strains called Octane Cannabis that's coming. So Hey, uh, if you start doing well with the, with the cannabis, which I know you will because that's what you're passionate about, that's where your intentions are now, would you ever consider starting your own race team or sponsoring a race car again? Um, if this leads to the capability of doing that, Yes, I would love to do that. Now, uh, that's the end of the movie right there. If you ever could launch a team that wins at Indianapolis, holy mackerel, what a fucking yeah. ending that would be. Yeah. So since I've come out, I've done five races Yeah. Uh, with a couple of different teams and um, not professional, but amateur racing. Right. Uh, so uh, done five and... Um, you know, would like to do some more. Oh, so you want to keep racing? I didn't even realize that that was a big uh, thing on your list. Well, I, I would hop in a race car. I've had right. some health issues, but um, uh -huh. you know, I, I still, for the last few years, I've been high performance driving instructor and in a Corvette awesome. school. Right. So that's keeping me a little tuned up. There you go. Hey, it sounds like you, you got things in the right direction now. I, I, I only wish you the best of luck, and I, and I want to just thank you for hey. joining us today. And I want to thank our Thanks friend for, the for interview. making it happen. Uh, Survival of the fastest. Pick it up on there Amazon, it guys. It's a great story. It will be a book. It will be a movie for sure. I can guarantee you. Thank you. Thank you, Randy Lanier. Thank you, Dave. All right, guys. And that's going to take us to the end of another RX Muscle Spotlight. One of my favorite interviews of all time. Thank you, Randy Lanier. We'll see you next uh, time. Cheers.